This morning I want to talk to you from Galatians chapter 4, verse 19, Matthew chapter 2, verse 13 through 16, and verse 19 and 20. I want to talk to you about when you are pregnant with Christ. And I want to ask you this morning, are you pregnant with Christ? It is known as the greatest story ever told. He was born of a virgin by immaculate conception. His miraculous birth was a fulfillment of an ancient prophecy. When he was born, the ruling tyrant of that day wanted to kill him. His parents had to flee to safety to protect the holy child. All male children under the age of two were killed by this ruler as he sought to kill the holy child. Angels and shepherds attended his birth, and he was given gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. He would grow to be worshipped as the savior of men, and he led a moral and humble life. He performed miracles such as healing the sick, casting out demons, raising the dead. He was put to death, but rose from the dead to ascend back to heaven. Do you know whom I speak of? How many of you in here know whom I speak of? This story sounds very similar to the story of Jesus, but it's not simply the story of Jesus. It is also the story of Horus of Egypt, who lived 10,000 years before the Christian story. It is the story of Krishna of Hindustan. That story preceded the Christian story by 700 years. It is the story of Odin of Scandinavia, of Baal of Phoenicia, of Tammuz of Babylon. You can read his story or this aspect of, of his story in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 8. It is the story of Bedru of Japan. And yes, it is the story of Jesus of Nazareth. It is called the greatest story ever told. And indeed, it is the greatest story ever been told. Why is it the greatest story? that's been told. It is great because that story unites all cultures, all people, of all religion, of all geography, from all cultures and ethnicities. It's great because it teaches all people to understand that through this story, we all are sons of God. This is the story of the S-U-N, the story of the sun. We all share this planet, and we all, no matter where we come from, or what ethnicity, or what language we speak, we are all born under the sun. We live and move our being under the sun. This is why when you read the Old Testament, the relationship between the S-U-N and the power behind the S-U-N, the sun, is the sun, the S-O-N, the spiritual power behind the sun. Psalm 84, verse 11, if you read in your Bible, I hope you're taking notes and pay attention to what I'm telling you. Psalm 84, verse 11 says, For the Lord God is a sun, as you in itself, and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. So every time you witness the rising of the sun, the setting of the sun, it's not just some literal physical orb that you take for granted. 
It is the manifestation of God's grace on all of us. And the Bible calls this common grace. Jesus says in Matthew 5 that God allows the sun, the S-U-N, to shine on the just and the unjust. That's the gift. That's the gift of God. We read about this sun in a more esoteric, in a more spiritual sense in Malachi chapter 4, verse 2. It says, but to you who fear my name, but to you who fear my name, the son of righteousness, and the word is clearly spelled in Malachi 4, 2, the son of S-U-N of righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings. The solar orb with wings did not begin with Jewish thought or Hebrew thought. It existed in Egypt, in Kemet, in ancient Egypt, Kemet. And this is where the Hebrews got their understanding from. So what is so special about the sun? The sun is the true power in our solar system. It is an amazing generator of electromagnetic energy, which, is a, which affects all of our lives. And it affects our behavior every second of the day. That's what the S-U-N does on all of us. The sun contains 99% of the mass of this solar system. The sun is the solar system. You are not just in the sun, you are of the sun. And whatever changes happen on the sun, those changes happen to you. However the, sun is, however the sun is affected, you are affected. Every planet under its power is affected. You are not only of the sun, you are the sun. You are in the sun. Understanding the solar cycles and the changing nature of its energy allows you to, uh, to participate or allows you to anticipate how humans will react and behave to various events in their lives. That's how much power the sun has over all of us. When you understand its movements, I meant to bring, I meant to bring a chart, a diagram, that shows the cycles of the sun, the movement of the sun. I meant to show that to you, I forgot it. But if you looked at it, you would ask yourself the question, who charted the movement of the sun? In order to do that, you have to be standing outside of the solar system to watch it move. Now here's the point that I want to share with you. While the masses of people worship the sun, the literal sun, the S-U-N, for its daylight and its ability to cause crops to grow, the deeper thinkers called the adepts, they understood that there was a spiritual power behind the sun. And it was the means by which they could evolve and develop their intellectual and their spiritual potential. This intellectual and spiritual potential is called enlightenment. I want you to understand what I just told you. While the ancients created elaborate stories about the movement of the sun and anthropomorphized it, across the world. The people who truly did understand the significance 
of how to use the sun. They use it in a way that the masses did not know and understand. They use it as a means of intellectually and spiritually enlightening them. Brothers and sisters, what I'm telling you is a deep secret of the solar teachings and how they are intricately related to the faith that we hold, which I'll go deeper into a little bit later. The average person has about two digits IQ. Some geniuses have three digits IQ. But the truth of the matter is, every last one of you have about a 10 digit, 12 digit IQ. The problem is, you don't know how to access it. The ancient people understood how to use sunlight to increase their intelligence and their communication with God. Those people who understood what I just shared with you, and they were able to embody this truth, they became known as the sons of God. You go in the Bible and you'll read in Job, where it says, and the sons of God, the S-O-N of God. These were angels. You read in Genesis chapter 6, where it says that the sons of God saw the daughters of men were beautiful. The S-O-N. In the Hebrew, it's called the B'nai Elohim, the sons of God. In the New Testament, the sons of God, or the son of God, is referred to as the Christ. And in Romans chapter 8, verse 29, we read this. For whom the creator, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. That he, the son of God, might be the firstborn of many brothers. Now what that verse is trying to tell you is that you and I have Christ's potential. The allegory of the son is the story of the hidden son, the S-O-N son, or the inner light that shines in every human. This is why the gospel, this is why in the gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 4, the writer says, and I hope you are paying attention and writing this down. He says in John 1, verse 4, in him, because in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, the word is the son of God, the S-O-N of God, the spiritual power behind all creation. It says that son, that light, in him was light, and the light was the light of men. What that means is this, is that in every one of us is God potential. There is an understanding, there is an enlightenment, there is an intelligence, there is a potential, there is a possibility that is lying dormant in each and every one of us. Your and my ability to do miraculous things, to have infinite intelligence and wisdom, is lying within the soul of every one of you. Therefore, today, as we come together and we call this day Christmas, the sun appears on this day to stand still. That's why it's called the winter solstice. Solstice means sun stands still. And as I told you earlier, whatever the sun does, it is affecting you. Therefore, as we go through this the shortest days of the year, which is December 21st, 22nd, 23rd. There is a sense where, whereby we are experiencing a, a Passover, a transition from darkness to light. And on December 25th, on December 25th, the sun begins to move and the days begin to get longer than the nights. This is the power that is in all of us. 
to transcend the darkness, to transcend depression, to transcend difficulty, because every year you are experiencing within your eternal, within your within your nature, you are experiencing a new birth. This is what the adepts understood back. Jesus, the story of Jesus is an allegory. It is a symbolism of the sun, the S-U-N. And this allegory and this symbol is called to awaken the Christ, the anointed light in your consciousness. Therefore, there is something that you and I must be doing today. Your soul, my soul, our soul is the reason for the season. Your soul, my soul are the reason for the season. You are the Jesus in the Christ story. You are the reason for the season. You are the Christ waiting to be born. There is the Christ in you waiting to awaken waiting to be developed. And this is why I ask every one of you the question. And nothing that I'm saying is contrary to the Bible. It is in the Bible. But the problem is someone has hit you in the head and has not shared with you the deeper secrets in the Bible. I am going to correct that today. Because I want you to reach your divine potential, your divine human potential. And therefore, I ask you the question today, are you pregnant with Christ? Are you pregnant with Christ? Galatians chapter 4, verse 19, reads this way. My little children, for whom I labor in birth again until Christ is formed in you. So it must be clear here that the Apostle Paul, who wrote this, understood that there was a deeper meaning of the Christ than just simply the human historical Jesus we read about in the Bible. He understood that there, that this Christ that we worship today about had to be a personal embodied experience that all of us can tap into. That's why he asked, that's why he said, my little children for whom I labor in birth again until Christ is formed in you. I know for many of you hearing this, it may seem frightening, concerning, but if you allow this truth to penetrate your mind, a beautiful idea will begin to percolate within your soul and within your heart, and you will begin to conceive how great you are, the great potential that lies asleep and dormant late in many of you. For those of you who are familiar with this, who are already confident in your intellectual understanding of this information, you need to open your heart and begin to embody the process of becoming the Christ, to transform your body and your mind and your soul into a human body of life. Everything we read about Jesus in the Bible is an allegory to what your potential is in you. And as long as we keep separating, keep separating the Christ of history and the Christ of your own personal growth, you will never achieve what God has demanded that you achieve. Consider the passage I just wrote, uh, I just read. It is written by the Apostle Paul, who some people consider to be Apollonius of Tyana. He says, my little children for whom I labor in birth 
again until Christ is formed in you. Paul imagines himself as the midwife of the people or the believers in Galatia. And he wants them to give birth to the Christ in them. In other words, he understood that it was not enough for them just to accept Jesus. They had to become Jesus. And that's what I want you to understand. What is he implying? Salvation is a process of unveiling and empowering and becoming the fullness of God in bodily form. What many of us are working on, we are living out of what is called the outer story. But this is not enough. As I told you earlier, you read and heard the same story told in different countries and different geographies and different places. It is a great story to tell. It's a universal tell, to, uh, telling of the story. But as long as we deal with the outer mystery, we'll have all these religions actually talking about the same story but in different language and different context. But all that it will produce is who's right, who's wrong, who's, whose land we worship, whose land we, we don't worship. It'll, 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 it'll only create it only create who's going to heaven and who's going to hell according to my culture, my language, my background. And all we'll do is create images of this allegory, this story, in the likeness of black folk or white folk or Jewish people or Chinese people or Buddhists or, 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 or um, uh, Muslims or whatever, but we will only be on the outside of the truth of what the story recorded in the gospel are trying to provoke out of us. And once you infect the Christ concept, once you infect this solar understanding with beliefs about nationalism and ethnocentricity and racism and sexism and speciesism, it will only produce sectarianism, division, strife, war. We got to get beyond that. We have to begin to see the deeper meaning of what the, what the scriptures are trying to say. And that's what Apostle Paul is doing here. It'll create events in our history as it already has. Events like witch hunts and, and, and inquisition and slavery and commercialism. Brothers and sisters, this day has something a lot more to do with your spiritual soul, your evolution than you can ever imagine. The Christ is a person that you are to become. For Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Y'all all right? The Christ is a power that you are to develop. That's why Jesus says in John chapter 14, verse 12. The things that you shall do what I do, and greater things than these shall you do. But you cannot do them if you do not become Christ. This is why we read that the Christ is the principle of, of the cosmos. It is cosmic energy. So when signs are talking about, when the signs are talking about uh, the strong force, the weak force, the nuclear force, when the scientists are talking about gravity, when they're talking about dark matter and dark energy, they are talking about the crystal. They are talking about the Christ. When Afrocentric scholars are talking about dark, uh, uh, dark matter and dark energy and, and, and melanin, they are talking about the Christ. The Christ is the potential for your evolution. In 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17, it says, If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. A new creation. He is a new creation. It's beyond whether or not you don't stop smoking, you don't stop running women, you, 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 know, you stop gambling. All these things are things that religion put upon you. But the truth of the matter is, you have the very ability within you with the proper practices and with the proper knowledge to transform your human body into a human 
body alike, to transfigure your physical body into a body of light. That's what was talked about at the Mount of Transfiguration. That's what Jesus was showing us in the resurrection that we are talking about in Easter. That is what John, in the epistle of John, chapter 3, verse 2, says, it has not yet appeared what we shall be, but when he comes and we see him as he is, we shall be like him. The only problem is, is that we don't know the mechanism of how to transform ourselves. It begins, brothers and sisters, with giving birth to the Christ. So I ask you again, is there anybody in here this room this morning? Is there anybody in here who's pregnant with the Christ idea? What inspired dream idea of your divine human soul are you bringing forth in 2014? That would be the gift to the world, a gift to your community, or a gift to your church. Are you pregnant this morning? What divine mission beyond working from nine to five on your job? What divine mission have you conceived or has been conceived by the Holy Spirit, that holy spark that has called you to a path of uncommon balance? that most people don't even walk. What empowerment of your soul can you feel growing in your consciousness that will serve the people that, 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 that you must complete in the year 2014? What realization are you having that you are more than a mere human, but that you are a divine son of God and that idea has impregnated your soul, so much so that your goal in 2014 is to explore your divinity under a master teacher and dedicate yourself to his teaching. When you are pregnant with Christ, the question becomes, will your dreams, your vision, your mission, your realization come to turn? Because many of you today, I, if, if, you, if you take time and you spend time with God in meditation, God will begin to speak to your soul and put something on your heart and your mind that will grab you, that will just intrigue you. It'll be like Moses in the burning bush. You got to go search it out. This is why when you have that flame, that fire burning inside, it's like giving, it's like labor pain. You see, it's not just simply easy believism. Well, I believe in Jesus. I believe in Jesus. I said my Easter speech. I said my Christmas speech. It's not just easy believing that can bring birth to this child. You can't just simply say, well, yeah, I have a dream. I have a dream. I have a dream. It's bringing that dream to turn. And it's just takes something more than just I believe it. You have to develop it. It takes work. So, which one of you today have been inspired, have been turned on. Something spiritual is growing inside your belly. You can feel God calling you beyond the normal, beyond the natural. How many of you in here today can say, I am pregnant with the Christ idea? The Christ is the anointing. You have something burning within you, like Jeremiah says, like fire, shut up in my bones. I submit to you today that people who walk in the outer story, they have no Christ. Because that's something that Jesus did 2,000 years ago. But that's not something that they are doing in God today. And that's the reason, brothers and sisters, you don't see, you don't see excitement, you don't see boldness, and you don't see commitment in the church of God. Because we have people who are on the outside dealing with the dealing with the, the story and not dealing with the spiritual experience that the story speaks of. So for those of you who are here today, something got a hold of you. Something hit you one night 
Something you heard in a sermon, in a message, in a seminar, something hits you and it has you. And you feel like there's something growing inside of you. There's an idea growing inside of you. There's a movement growing inside of you. There's a book growing inside of you. There's a poem, a song growing inside of you. There's a business growing inside of you. You are pregnant with an idea from God, from the Holy Spirit. You are pregnant with that. The question is, when you are pregnant with Christ, what do you do? <clears throat> and this is what we find in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 2, verse 13 and 16, verse 19 and 20. The Gospel story in Matthew 2 provides the perfect allegory to answer the question, when you are pregnant with the Christ, what do you do? We know the story. Mary and Joseph. Well, I take it back. Found in Sunday school. Many of us don't know the story. I don't know what we've been doing in Sunday school all these many years. But anyway, the story of Mary and Joseph and the baby Jesus. Joseph engaged to Mary. Mary tells the brother she's pregnant. She's pregnant by the Holy Spirit. She's having a virgin birth. Yeah. Joseph, not desiring to put her away and embarrass her, he takes her as his wife. An angel speaks to him and says, this is of God. The wise men come looking for Jesus Herod says to them, show me where he is. And a star had appeared in the sky. <clears throat> They're following the star because wise men follow the star where Jesus is. All symbolism, all deep talk. I'm not going to have a chance to go into all that today. But Joseph proceeds in a dream communicated to him by an angel that he needs to take Mary and the baby the ancient commit. Let's pick up from there. Mary in the story is symbolic of your subconscious mind. It is a subconscious mind in communication with the unconscious mind, which is where the God dwells, God in you dwells. It is a subconscious mind that is able to be impregnated with the idea Mary is a virgin. Now, let's not get confused here, because this is where when we get literal, we begin to get confused. When I tell you, I ask you, are you pregnant with the Christ idea? Because you say, I ain't no virgin. I stopped being a virgin, you know, a long, long time ago. Because that's you look at the story from a literal standpoint. But the virginity of your subconscious mind is when you surrender as Mary did. She surrendered herself. When you surrender your heart, when you open your fourth chakra, when you surrender your heart to God. It's a beautiful story because it tells us that no matter what your physical or personal experience is, anybody, no matter what type of life you have lived, if you open and surrender yourself to God. The Bible says in Lamentations, I think chapter 3, verse 2, says, morning by morning, new mercies I see. To be pregnant with the Christ idea and to know that you may not have always been attentive to your spiritual growth, you may not have always been walking in a proper behavior and everything, but to know that no matter who you are, there's a, when you Surrender your heart and open up your soul to God. God will enter into you and your heart becomes like a virgin, untouched, only dedicated to the power of God. That is what we call the grace of God. How many of you in here today? 
Knowing always that you hadn't always prayed, hadn't always studied the Bible, hadn't always walked faithfully, but yet still, God still spoke to you. God still met you somewhere. And God gave you something in your heart. That's the grace of God. So anybody can be married. No matter what walk of life you can find, all you got to do is surrender your subconscious mind and say, not my will, but thy will be done. You see, it begins with that surrender. Because many of us, even though we claim, I said Jesus, I know Jesus, you had not surrendered your heart. And that's why you can't receive a new idea. That's why you can't receive a vision. That's why you can't receive a, a spirit-led mission. Because you have, you have not surrendered your heart and become a virgin in your heart toward God. But when you surrender yourself and say, Lord, not my way, not my will, that will, God enters into you and he leaves something in you. That's called a new idea, a vision, a dream. Y'all all right? This is what happens when you surrender like Mary. And you know what? You don't understand it. It's beyond your conscious understanding. It makes no sense to you, but you know you've been touched. It can overwhelm you. Other people think you're lying because they know how you used to be when you walk the street. They say, you must be crazy. Why are you talking all this God talk? Why are you having, talking about all these experiences? It may even make you think that you're not stable. People look around. As a matter of fact, I'm going to tell you something. One of the worst places you can start talking about crip out there is among church people. <laughs> because, because many of them have never surrendered their heart. They, they've only been dumped in some water that they call baptism. Or they only join a church that we call <coughs> join the church on a membership roll. When you start talking about having union and communion and identity with God, they think you're crazy. When you start talking about relating to angels, when you start talking about developing your soul, church folk don't understand that. But something you know is emerging inside of you. Then we come to Joseph. Joseph is symbolic of your conscious mind. You see, Joseph had the great task of having to accept a child that was not his. You see, your conscious mind knows that this thing going on inside you, I didn't put it there. It didn't come through your education. It didn't come through your political relationship. It didn't come through your friendship. This came by God. This was a vision put in your heart by God. And your conscious mind now has to determine whether or not I'm going to trust my heart. This is one of the reasons why a lot of men, still technically speaking, don't trust women. Because, because they have experiences and they are loaded with doubt. They don't believe when she, when she may say, this is what we should do. Men don't believe that. But when a man, under the, when the conscious mind, under the control of the Holy Spirit, listens to what the angel says to him, he surrenders his doubt. He surrenders his fear. And he takes responsibility and say, I will see to it that you subconscious mind and this idea that you have comes to fruition. You see, it is the conscious mind that protects the unconscious heart. I mean, the subconscious heart. Mary and Joseph are what happens when your heart and your mind become one. And what I'm saying to you, this is the key, this is the first step, brothers and sisters, in order for your vision, your idea, your dream in order for it to come to fruition. Listen to me now. This is what happens when in order for your dream to happen, your conscious mind, which is in tune with the world, that sees the, the up and down of the world, your conscious mind has to take relationship with your subconscious mind. It has to believe the idea. This is why it says in Hebrews 11, chapter, chapter 11, verse 1, Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The subconscious mind believes it already. It doesn't have to have faith. It already is in tune because it knows gnostically. It knows what God has placed upon the heart. But the mind has to have faith 
And I submit to you that one of the reasons why many times your dreams and your visions and your goals and your plans and whatever you have don't happen because you're a man and your woman, you're Mary and your Joseph, your subconscious mind, your heart, and your conscious mind, your ego are in war with one another. But when you have mind heart agreement, all things become possible. And the mind won't let other people talk itself out of the heart's desire. And what's the first thing we notice is that the thing that we notice that in this story, what happened? It says, it says, now when they had departed, behold, and the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother. Flee to Kemet, flee to Egypt. Stay there until I bring you word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. And when he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt and was there until the death of Herod that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt I have called my son. This brings us to step number two. Is that the conscious mind, Joseph in you, your conscious mind, hears the word of God and it recognizes that in order for the Christ idea to survive, in other words, in order for your vision for 2014 to survive, in order for your dream for the 2014 year to survive, it recognizes that it must practice silence, protection, because not everybody wants your dream to come true. Herod is a symbol of all those naysayers, all those negative people, all those people who have evil intentions to make sure that you don't reach your divine potential. And the angel tells, angel tells Joseph, what? Take the child and flee and take it back to Egypt because out of Egypt I call my son. This is why many of you in the process of developing your dream and your vision trying to understand you can't do it in an environment that is challenging you. You can't do it in an environment that does not appreciate spirituality or vision and dream. You have to go to a land, the land of the blacks, the land of Kemet, the land of Egypt, and become a son of God. This is why one of the most important things many of you ever can do is to truly understand Christianity, to truly understand spirituality, to understand where these concepts come from, baptism, Lord's Supper, miracles, uh, uh, salvation, resurrection, to understand where these subjects come from, you got to go back and begin to study Egypt. That's why, that's one of the reasons why I appreciate God for the, the, the academic and the intellectual study that our brother James Lamb does in his new book called Black. That's why I appreciate the work that he does because what it's doing is allowing all of us to go back and recover. And before you step out there and say, here I am, world, with this new idea, with this new concept, with this Christ in me coming forth, I need to go somewhere and be silent and study and learn and be developed. And at the right time, God will say, out of Egypt, I have called my son. Do you understand what I'm telling you? One of the great problems and mistakes I see many desiring parents do when God gives us a child, a baby, a child, a child, not an idea, but a child, and that child shows intellect, and that child shows promise, and that child shows a skill, early skill. They can dance, and they can sing, and they can perform, and they can think. We're so quick to want to make them come forward. We want to put them out there in the public. And you don't realize that you are putting your child in the matrix that has very, the very intention to scout out gifted and talented young men and women to either conform them to their purpose or to destroy them in the prisons and in the streets of America. A lot of, a lot of a lot of the men and women who are in prison today are not dumb, are not stupid. They are gifted and talented young men and women who got caught up 
and put out into the streets, into the prisons, and they are using their gifts and their talents not to develop Christ. Have you noticed, brothers and sisters, look at all the, the so-called child stars. Ask yourself, document the movement of their life. They got out there, they was out there in the public, they showed great feeling, and great promise, and look at how their lives turned out when they became adults. Because their mother or their father didn't have the Joseph mind to listen to the angel say, be silent about your dreams, your vision, your child. And don't give them a lot of attention. They need to go to Egypt to be developed. But in our ego as parents who want to get, who want to get uh, uh, attention and recognition, we surrender our children unprepared in a world. Many of you have great ideas and you're too quick to talk about them. And you don't know that you want to practice the wisdom of silence. The Bible teaches us about Joseph. Joseph was in, in, in the Bible. He had visions and dreams. His father gave him a coat of many colors, but it provoked his brothers to jealousy. Some wanted to kill him, but they sold him into slavery because Joseph and his father weren't wise about the gift that God gave them. Many of you don't realize back in the 1960s, the FBI. I'm going I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to get deep with you because I know for many of you have been trained in this world and that in this world system and you don't understand the evil that surrounds you in this matrix. You don't understand because you've been poised and hit over the head with the idea that does not allow your truth to come forth. But in the 1960s, in the 1960s, the FBI under J. Edgar Hoover had a program called Cointel Pro. What was the purpose of the program? It was to seek and to discover black messiahs. That's written, brothers and sisters, in government documents. They were looking for a black messiah, somebody that will rise up in the community. Why? Because even they understand that there is a spiritual order behind the physical order that will bring forth children who will be the answer to our problem because these children back here are the sons of God. Like the scripture says, unto this day a child is born, a son is given. They are the answers that the ancestors prayed about and they have come forth. It is our duty as adults to be Joseph, to protect them, to teach them, to develop them so they can go out there and do what they've been called to do. But in our, but in our ego, yeah. we compete and we want to make my child better than your child. And don't understand that you are operating in the ego, contributing to the death and the destruction of your own gift that God has given you. Yeah. The FBI had a program called COINTELPRO. It was designed, it was designed to find messiahs and therefore, they sent agent provocateurs into the black community. Some went to the black clubs. Some taught in school. Some uh, attended church to observe what was the talent and the, the, the precociousness going on inside those institutions. And they sent black folk inside there who went and told who was coming up. They infected and invaded organizations like SNCC, the SCLC under Dr. King, the Nation of Islam. They infiltrated those organizations and created havoc, competition, division to the point whereby people in the organization wanted to kill Malcolm, wanted to kill Martin, wanted to kill Mega Evans because we were not wise about the Christ idea and how to this is why I talk to you about communicating with angels. I'm not saying this, I'm trying to be novel. I'm telling this because this is in the scripture and it is the truth of God. It is in your own ignorance that you reject it to the destruction of your family, your community, and your church. Amen. It's time that we got to wake up to understand this. 
The third thing we receive, the third point that we bring out here is this. At the time, the right time, the same angel came back and spoke to Joseph and said, Herod is dead. Herod is dead. Arise, take the child back to his home. It says, now when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to whom? Joseph, the conscious mind. That's the man. Arise, take the young child and his mother and go to the land of Israel. For those who sought the young child's life are dead. What is this trying to tell us? Step three. Place the Christ idea in a safe and peaceful environment. Spiritual environment. That embraces its growth and maturation. The Christ idea must be placed in an environment that supports its growth and its development in you. As I come to my seat and I close, I want to say to you this morning, you can say whatever you want to say about me, about Grace Evangelical Baptist Church. We may not be the biggest church. I might not be the most well-known popular minister in your city. Uh, we may not definitely not the most financially supported church in this community, but we are a child-friendly church. We are a spiritual, evolutionary friendly church. We are a new thought friendly church. And if you come here, you will grow. If you come here, you will learn. If you come here, you will not be the same when you leave that you were when you came. Amen. Let the church say amen, somebody. Amen. And this is the kind of environment that the future great men and women of our society, the sons and daughters of God, can grow and develop the Christ within them. Therefore, get pregnant with Christ. And if you are pregnant with Christ, be wise with your Christ idea. Be committed to its growth. Have faith in God. Be protective of your Christ idea. Listen to the holy angels and be silent when they tell you to be silent about your potential, about your plan, about your purpose. Be conscious with your Christ. In other words, put it in a spiritual supportive environment that will nurture your Christ idea. Why? Because you are, you are, you are the greatest story ever been told. You are the, you are the reason for the season. You are the Buddha. You are, the, you are Krishna. You are Horus. You are Jesus. You are the son of the living God. And as the angels say, I close and say, glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace and goodwill toward men. Amen.